Is there a writing craft book on your bedside table? Has it been there for a while? Do you keep meaning to get past chapter two or chapter one or just the first page? Then the Words to Write By podcast is for you. Hi, I'm Renee. I teach composition and creative writing to college students. My background is in poetry, but I'm working on my memoir. And I'm Kim. I'm trained as a science journalist, but now I'm trying my hand at short fiction. Each week we'll be tackling a chapter of some well-known, but perhaps not so well-read, writing craft book. Together, we'll uncover brilliant insights, face the hard truths, and totally disagree when the author is wrong. This is our podcast, after all. And then, we're going to take what we learn and apply it to our own writing. By doing the book's suggested exercises. We're inviting you to read along, or just tune in for the Cliff Notes version. We're committed to improving our own craft, one writing advice book at a time. And we'd love for you to join us. We have an announcement. We are on another podcast. This one is by Chris Cookley, uh, who does Who Makes a Podcast. So all of those writers out there who want to see how to make a podcast, go check out uh, Chris Cookley's Who Makes a Podcast episode. It comes out on Wednesday. Welcome to Words to Write By. Hey, Renee, what have you written recently? Uh, I've written quite a few things. I've been taking a class. It's very much like Shut Up and Write. You show up uh, three days a week for... I believe it's four hours a day, and that's that's quite a bit. I've been chipping away at a scene. I may have made a big stylistic leap. Mm. Decided to start writing in present tense for certain Ooh. stuff. And yeah, big. <laughs> Ooh. I've also been writing for the San Jose Women's Club. I am now their director of communications and public relations. Congratulations. And thank you. <laughs> so I have lots to do, like writing newsletters and announcements and getting in touch with people. Anyway, if you live in uh, the San Jose area or are close by, you can become a member. It's free right now. And you come and check out our really cool uh, stuff. So yeah, lots of writing. How about you, Kim? What have you written? Well, I just got over COVID. <laughs> dun dun. <laughs> Hit the whole family. So, not much writing was happening, but um, sometimes it's good to take a break like that because suddenly it's much more important in your mind that you really do want to finish this novel. And so, um, yesterday I wrote a thousand words on nice. it, and I hope to continue writing every day. So that's the goal. We'll see. Well, it just so happens that we're going to be going on a writing retreat soon. And we will not be able to escape the page for about four days. Right. And part of my goal is to do a lot of writing now so that I don't show up at the writing retreat and then have to jumpstart myself into writing. Oh, that's a good idea. Yeah. So I want to be like regularly writing before the retreat so that I just can really up my words as opposed to sometimes you do a retreat to kind of jumpstart you, but I want to be already in gear writing. Yeah. I have to come up with something similar because I want it to be a very productive thing. But... Have you ever thought of going on a retreat? Well, <laughs> we're going to do a cool episode uh, where we record our efforts trying to be out in the woods writing with no choice. Let's we'll see if it works out. And now on to chapter nine of Scene and Structure. After 70 pages of Jack Bacon's Scene and Structure, we've got a pretty good handle on how to break our story down into action-packed disaster ending scenes and the more contemplative internal sequels that hold the book together. What we haven't quite found is examples of this scene sequel sequence, say that three times, in the books that we own. So what gives Bickham? Apparently, there are multiple variations in chapter nine. Bickham gives us 10 options to vary your scene and sequel so it's not so obvious. Today, we are going to go into two of these in depth, the scene within a scene and the flashback as embedded in a sequel. And with that, on to the discussion. We are about halfway through this book. Actually, no, we're further ahead because there's appendices in the back. So I don't know if that counts towards page count, but, you know, you flip back and forth seeing the examples that he provides, which I might say I appreciate very much. Not only does Jack Bickham put himself under the bus here by putting his own examples in, but he actually has examples. More than I can say for other authors that we've reviewed. Gardner, excuse me. So chapter nine is variations in the internal structure of scene and sequel. I found this to be kind of a bit of extension of the previous 
podcast where he was talking about using scene and sequel for pacing, and this is like putting variations in the scene and sequel. So your novel just isn't scene, sequel, scene, sequel, scene, sequel until the end. It's still read a lot like trying to program your VCR to record at a later date, for those of you who remember VCRs. I actually had a hard time reading. I kept rereading it and rereading it like, what is he talking about? (laughs) Bickham's theory is that every novel or every page turner novel, which would be pretty much anything other than experimental or highly um, literary novels, follow a scene and sequel structure. I'm still not convinced that that's necessarily the case because whenever I try to look for them, it's much harder to find them. He claims that you write your story originally as a classic scene and sequels, and then you can use these techniques to vary it so it's not obviously following that structure. So that's that's what I think is weird here. He actually admits that it's hard to find the scene structure regimen in the real world, in the wild, in books. In the library. In the library. And that makes me think, does that not disprove his pattern? Now, this chapter, it is dedicated to variations, right? Ways in which it's not following that regimented form. Mm -hmm. But still, it's like, well, how can you come up with a regimented form at all if you're not seeing them in the wild? Right. But, you know, you can live in a house your entire life and not know how the plumbing or electricity is in the walls. I guess so. All right. The question is, do authors employ a very rigid technique in doing the first draft of the novel and then go through it and change things up? Or do writers just come up with these really odd ways of telling their story, a very organic, you know, just from as it comes out of their mind? Right. And I was just in that workshop and one person was talking about how they had a big board of butcher paper and they put all these note cards on it. And I was like, well, what's on your note cards? Right? Like, I don't know if you're reading Jack Bickham. (laughs) I don't know if you've read another book, but I've actually seen the reference to these novelists' note cards in other places. Knives Out. I don't know if anyone's seen Knives Out. Of course you have, because it's a good movie. The old man is a novelist, and there's a scene where he's talking to the protagonist, and in the background, there's these note cards and sticky notes that are taped on his desk and I was like there's the note cards I see them but what's on them (laughs) I think any old school novelist has that kind of right yeah okay and we did that actually as our activity Mm -hmm. but now he's saying that you should plan your story originally in classic scenes and sequels arranged in the classic straight sequential pattern with nothing skipped anywhere and no part of anything out of its normal order. So you have written fiction, and you've worked on your memoir, which has elements that are kind of fictions. Do you ever get to a point where, like, you know that you want your characters to be doing this thing or that thing? They just finish one set of things, and you know you have to transition them, and you have no clue on how to get them there? Do you ever look and say, "I I need just to write something to get them to the spot, but I can't even figure out how to do it? I haven't written enough fiction. I already know where characters are going in the memoir, obviously. When I have written fiction, I did a lot of talking to reveal information, and I don't necessarily know if that was the way to go. This would alleviate that problem because you'd know that you couldn't have talking heads talking about this because you actually needed a scene here because that was what was required, and then you needed a response in the sequel. Using the Bickham strategy, anytime you'd have two characters in dialogue, it would either be explicitly in a conflict of a scene, or it would be in that processing of a scene. Right. But it wouldn't be, let me explain to you how this society works and what you need to do in this society, and now I will talk and talk and talk and talk. Right. So anyway, if you ever want to know what's on these cards, (laughs) that was like a few episodes ago. Now he's saying that even if you're going to add variation to the elements of a scene, it's best to start with making a very regimented outline of this classic scene and sequel structure. He even goes so far as to say that there are novels that strictly follow 
seeing sequel, seeing sequel. I don't know if that's true, but dear listener, if you know of a book that follows this pattern, like religiously, let us know. (laughs) I'm very curious. I think that in the past, there was more formula novels put out because access was a thing. Your novel had to be printed and you had to buy it in a bookstore or a drugstore or something. You had to pick it off the shelf. And nowadays, anybody can write and they can make their stuff available electronically. So if you're just in the mood for something that's not really highbrow, but just kind of like sounds good, you probably can find it online. But people self-edit don't necessarily self-edit along these lines. So there's more bad writing that is original bad writing as opposed to bad formulaic writing. If there are novels like this in the wild, it would be like a young adult book. I do actually try to look for the young adult stuff. When I'm looking for stuff to match what Bickham's talking about. Oh, right. So I guess it does exist. But even that, I don't know if it quite follows. I got to pull out Pullman and see. Well, here the problem is. My book collection is made up of authors that I feel go above and beyond. So even if they do use the scene and structure, they go through and they use so many variations that you can't find it in there anymore. Right. A lot of my collection is, it's very literary. Mm-hmm. And the stuff that maybe that I perhaps might own on my Kindle that does follow the Jack Pickham strategy, I'm not quite sure if I want to reveal that I actually own it or have read it. <laughs> Oh, I see. Yes, the the dreaded mixtape. The dreaded music list. You don't Don't want anyone to hear. Don't look what I picked up on Kindle Unlimited. I like just for fun. Yeah, I'm not sharing my running mix. Like, it's pretty bad. I think we have more diversity in what people write, which doesn't necessarily mean that we have better writers now than we had back then. It's just back then, you had probably stronger editors that make people follow these formulas. And now a lot of that fiction I read online (laughs) doesn't follow those formulas at all, probably to its detriment. (laughs) It could be to its detriment. Yes, that is that is true. It could be. Um, So yeah, I guess it depends what kind of book you want to write. But if you want to write a Bickham book, he says that once you've laid out your scene structure, scene structure, then you can go back and do variations. And he has five bullet points for variations in the scene structure and five bullet points for variations in the sequel structure. And last time we really did go through the list of all the different ways to do PASIC. So to mix it up, or perhaps just because I don't want to do that again today, (laughs) let's pick one from each of these that's interesting and talk about it. Okay. Let's start with a variation in scene structure. And the one that I found most interesting in this, because he talks about like cutting things or not saying your goal at the beginning and telling it later and all that stuff. What I found the most interesting was number three on this list. You can interrupt the scene virtually anywhere by having other action intervene. What he's saying is you can have a scene within a scene. Yeah. And that is something I see in the wild. So for the examples he gives, Here's the explanation. A scene is underway and a fight is on, but again, another character intervenes, so her scene takes momentary precedence over the original scene. You can have a scene within a scene, and probably our main scene will not get played out in its conclusion until the interrupting scene has concluded. When I was reading this, I had to think of Inception. Ah. <laughs> we're like, we're doing this thing, but now we're jumping into this next thing. Or another one that did it was Cloud Atlas, where like, you know, literally you inserted a completely brand new thing into this. And then when you finally got through that particular set of images, then you jumped directly back to where you were originally, and then you had to deal with whatever conflict was there. Right. So yeah, he says that the reason one might do this is to introduce additional temporary suspense for some reason. Mm -hmm. So then he mentions Appendix 6, where an example of this strategy is given. And so we turn to the back of the book to Appendix 6. This excerpt is from Chapter 5 of Katie, Kelly, and Heck by Jack Bickham. 1973. Oh, boy. I wonder if this one's still in print. <laughs> this one appears to be some kind of, um, not necessarily old-timey Western, but definitely small Western town city slicker girl comes in, and apparently there is a romance brewing. <laughs> he wrote a lot of Westerns, dear listener. 
Okay, this excerpt is from a comic novel in which Catherine Katie Blascombe goes to a remote frontier town in the Old West to claim her half of an unspecified inheritance from a long-lost uncle. Upon arrival, Katie and her young ward, Heck, 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 meet Mike Kelly, who is the dead uncle's business partner and co-inheritor with Katie. Katie is attracted to Mike, but denies it to herself and quickly takes a dislike to him. So basically, she's got this guy that she finds annoying but probably attractive and in the meantime there's this guy called mr root who comes to see her who is in the process of trying to ask her out apparently and there's a long back and forth conflict of will she say yes to him or not i feel a comprehensive tour of salvation its environs would interest you and enhance your understanding of the general situation i understand you have a young brother and he of course too is invited katie hid her frown he was going a little too fast for her her natural caution asserted itself i appreciate the kind offer mr root however the front door slammed open and rain scushed in katie turned startled and saw mike kelly hatless and muddy to the knees charged into the lobby he caught her with his fiery angry glance swung towards her and pointed a shaking finger at her there you are he bellowed by god the two of you are in cahoots already he used the word cahoots cahoots wow i like your accent this is doing pretty good (laughs) so he comes in and he he literally interrupts the scene right it's basically katie has been asked out she's about to turn him down so the scene goal will she say yes, is halted because suddenly we have Mike Kelly and he is angry. Right, and it's pretty clear he likes her too. So we know that this is just going to be one of those yes books where they like each other but refuse to admit it. It's a comedy, so, you know. And then they proceed to argue back and forth with such great... Uh, Listen, woman, you get to town at noon and the same day you file some stupid idiot lawsuit against me and then start getting the thick as hops with the worst gambler and drink watering. Ray Ruth said huskily, don't go too far, Mike. Mike Kelly ignored the threat in his voice. Mike was past worrying about threats. I'll talk to her, Ray. You keep your face shut, see? (laughs) Shut your pie hole, Ray. (laughs) But I'm not talking to you, Katie told Mike. My attorney has said all I wish to say to you, sir. (laughs) So we got it. It's a pretty clear cut. There's one scene happening But then another character comes in and he probably thinks that she's being wooed Mm -hmm. and is very jealous. Yes. And his actual being there is what causes her to say yes to Ray Root. I don't my schedule will be tomorrow, Ray, but possibly a tour of the era with you would not only be informative, but pleasant. Could you call about noon? Ray Root's grin was oily enough to fuel a tanker. Be my pleasure, little lady. You're going out with him? Mike Kelly gasped, stunned. Is it any of your business? Katie shot back immediately. You're crazy, Mike groaned. I come over here to talk sense to you. Good night, Ray, Katie said warmly to Ray Root, and thank you. Uh, I assume, Mr. Root, you'll get to the point. Call me Ray, Root urged. I hope to be your friend. <laughs> So the great thing about the appendices is that he gives you line numbers. So you can say, look, line four through six is we introduce a new character who will be in the scene again. Line seven through ten, Katie internalization to that stimulus, ending in decision to go do what she otherwise would not have done. So basically, we can break it all down. But he also got the two scenes. He has the outline. The goal mm-hmm. is roots to get Katie to go out. Katie's is to learn what Root wants. So he's got the goals for each character. Scene question. Will he get her to go out? Conflict. Root's deviousness opposed to Katie's probing. And then at the bottom it says, interrupted by scene two. The goal is now Mike's goal. He wants to talk. The scene question is, will he get her to talk? Conflict. Katie won't talk. (laughs) Disaster. (laughs) For Mike. No. (laughs) The answer is no. And then there's the resumption of scene one so it it goes back so it's like it starts the scene with root and katie mike enters the scene and then it goes back to root and katie and this i've seen the wild many times and i've written many of these Mm -hmm. so this is definitely a thing i'm not quite sure if it answers the fact that kitty won't talk to him 
and then we go back to the other scene or if they get kind of intermixed because mm -hmm. it does say further on at the uh, 141 to 142 in a voice that was almost inaudible he whispered i came to talk <laughs> <laughs> pathetic <laughs> so um you said you you have used this technique yeah in your memoir uh probably yeah i mean it makes sense to me I'm writing and then there's an interruption and then there's a side conversation and then it goes back. I mean, I think I have. Either I've written it or I've seen it enough times that I know this is totally a thing. It structurally works because he needed a reason why Katie would say yes to this guy. And he introduced it by putting another conflict and then backing out. I kind of wonder how you would write this in your original note card system. If you're writing a scene to interrupt a scene, it's so critical to the plot. This strikes me as something that would have to be part of the initial outline anyway yeah because he's got to reveal his jealousy or his assholery well they tend to go hand in hand <laughs> <laughs> but you know it's got to be clear that she wants to get back at him i think this is a really useful thing when you're writing to remember that if you're going to follow the system that you're not obliged to always get to the disaster before you start the next scene right and that's probably why it's sometimes really hard to figure out where like a scene goal is because it starts with one thing and then suddenly it switches because they've introduced a new scene goal. If you want the rest of the variations in scene structure, there are five of them. We listed one and we discussed it. So if you want the rest and with examples and explanation, Snark Notes on our Patreon site. So we're looking at the variations in sequel structure, and um, some of them are kind of similar to what he talks about before, but there was one interesting one, number five. You can insert one or more remembered scenes within the thought component of a sequel, meaning flashback. Dun-dun! You know you guys have done flashbacks. Everyone's done flashbacks, but you know up until this point, we haven't actually addressed it. True, because a flashback is a scene. Mm -hmm. You're remembering back on an actual scene that has occurred, so it's like you're going back in time. And it looks like he's saying your flashback should fit into the sequel, which makes sense because when you're in the middle of action, usually you shouldn't have a flashback. Right. You know, in a sequel, that's where a lot of the thinking happens. Mm -hmm. Not that a thinking can't happen during the scene. Bickham talks about that, but one of the components of sequel is thought. And people think in stories and they think in memories. And so your character may have a memory that plays out as a scene in their head during the sequel. And I think that fits a lot with when you're watching like TV shows or movies or something where something very big happens and then you see the character by themselves and then the flashback of that memory comes up. I was just watching yesterday uh, Stranger Things mm -hmm. and there was, sorry for the spoilers, there was a scene where Elle in a previous episode took a roller skate and bashed it into uh, another girl's nose. Then the next episode, she was having flashbacks to both that and a scene where a bunch of other kids had died and there's blood everywhere. And this is while she's sitting at a diner. Right. And so he gives an example, too, of this, and that's Appendix 5. Appendix 5. I like this one, but I felt like it was written a lot in summary, which we're told not to do, but apparently you can get away with it. Why don't you tell us what the setup is and what it is? Right. About. So there's this dude. He's Russian or Ukrainian? Yugoslavian and Yugoslavian. Ukrainian. Yugoslavian and Ukrainian. But he is in America. It, he's on the prairie. Of... Actually, he's in Saskatchewan. Where is that? Canada. Shitballs. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> I'm Californian. Well, he talks about the CIA and stuff. I just assumed. <laughs> All right, so this comes from his book, uh, Tiebreaker. There's this guy who used to be part of the KGB, or he's now being hunted by the KGB, which is who he used to work for. And now he reached out to the CIA. And he's actually running from both of them right now. But he's standing there in a prairie in Canada. And he's looking out at the expanse. And that gives him time to think. And he's trying to decide what to do next. And during this... He starts going back into his mind of him growing up with his mom and his dad. And his dad was an abusive jerk and his mom was very loving. So this set of flashbacks encompasses everything from his childhood to 
his parents' marriage falling apart to when his father dies to when his mother's disappeared to when he's recruited by the KGB because he's working for Yugoslavia at that time to where he decided to, to join the CIA. So there's a lot of information in this. This is like three pages and it spans like at least 25 years. Yeah. 25 years in the span of three pages as a flashback. And there's even an actual scene in it where the father leaves. And this comes in the story where we've been introduced to this character, Partek, earlier. And we've probably had a whole bunch of action and stuff like that. Now we finally get to who he is. It feels like an awful lot of information for background. And I would almost be more interested if the book had started with this history. I had an editor echoing in my head going, this all needs to be set up (laughs) with scene and all this other stuff. But I don't know, maybe not. For this book, this was not the point. He right. just wanted this a quick was, this background. Is a, this is a spy thriller kind of thing, and we're not doing a detailed character structure of what it's like to grow up in the Iron Curtain and to to defect and all that stuff. Right. This is a different story. It probably a shoot 'em up. This is actually from chapter eight. <clears throat> so this book has already gone underway. Right. This is a long time before we get to find out who this guy really is. So it was long. It was a lot of summary. So here's an example of scene. So he's staring out the prairie and he's thinking. And then he says, whatever I do, he thought there will be suffering. (laughs) And he goes on and then he starts talking about going to school. And then he goes, in 1966, note the transition, in 1966, Dominic had graduated from high school and entered the Yugoslav army by conscription. It should have been a happy development with hope for the future. But at almost the same time, something wonderful and something disastrous happened in the family. His mother, astonishingly, told him that she was pregnant, and his father, after a ghastly scene, ran away. Sending her son off to the army, Martina Partek was pale but resolute. I will manage, she told him. Father will come back, Dominic told her. No. She was like ice-covered stone. He could sense her inner trembling, but God, she was strong. He had always known she was strong, but in the moment her strength awed him. He will not come back, but if he tried, he can never stay here again. Mother, you are a man now, she told him with an eerie calm. I will tell you this. Alexei has gone away because of this child in my belly. You heard the shouting, the threats, and insults. We cannot feed another child, he says. We are too old, he says. But I tell you this, my son, one time long ago. No, this is another scene. Right, yes, it's another scene. And also he's even doing the whole conflict thing. Mm Mm-hmm. Oh, Yeah. yeah. And he's relating her saying what they said he said she said but man this this robs all this really interesting character drama by just really flattening them i agree i think this is a very interesting story i understand that this is not the story he wants to tell because he's not dwelling on it but i feel like if it's way more interesting than being in a chase scene in saskatchewan yeah way more interesting yeah he should have written this book anyway so but i tell you this my son oh the dialogue is cheesy i'm sorry i'm reading it that way but it's hard not to one time long ago there was another child in my belly alexi shouted and raved and i had an end put to that pregnancy still sometimes at night in my chair i look up from my sewing and there at the dark night window i see the face of that child of mine that child of mine i did not allow to be born i will not lose this child i will have this child and raise this child I will do that. Alexei is gone because he could not confront another child. He will not come back to me because I have chosen this child over him. Martina Partek's eyes looked far away and her jaw set. I do not think I will see Alexei's face at the window in the dark of night. And then it had been a grim home leaving. So then we're jumping back from that scene to more of the bigger flashback. And I do find it's interesting that he has a combination of summary and Uh, very detailed scenes within this entire large segment. Usually, you know, it's been no summary, but this being in a sequel, you can have summary, even though it's a summary of something that happened a long time ago. It just so happens that his summary had a very compelling story that seemed more compelling than the one he was telling in the overall book. But I've seen this played out in other books. And, you know, dear writer, if you are writing and you want to do some background of your character, right, where the background is important, but not so important that it has to be told within the story structure, this is a really good way to do it. 
put them in a situation where they have time to think and then do a nice sequel and throw some scenes in there from their past and that will help them connect with the protagonist. The other thing I had a problem with this one is that this was chapter eight of the book and we had been going along with them for some kind of CIA chasing and uh, and betrayals and back and forth and all that and fundamentally we didn't know who this guy was the entire time and then suddenly it's revealed now I think it illustrates the concept of a remembered scene within a sequel but it doesn't do it very well but you know it makes me think the type of book that it is I haven't read it I'm not sure but it seems like if it's like the Bourne trilogy or if it's like James Bond Nobody cares so much. They want shoot him up. And that could have been what was the first chapter for seven chapters. It was like this big action. So first of all, the Bourne trilogy obviously had to use flashbacks. The character has amnesia. And so things come back to him in a very not nearly so organic a way. Like he's in a situation where suddenly he remembers this flashback. And like until then, he wasn't even aware of that. So it has such a profound effect on his character direction and the character direction of the story. There must be a lot of these in the Bourne trilogy then. Yeah. I'm betting so. Neat. But the setup there is it really explains a fundamental aspect of his past that he didn't understand to explain why these people are chasing him or what, who he is. So that's probably a really good example of use of this. I'm not sure if his flashback is absolutely critical to understand the story. I mean, it was written pretty cheesily. Mm-hmm. You said you had another example, though. I went looking first through a lot of books, and I had a hard time finding it because like, finding something that fits really clearly with this is hard. Then I went to the internet and I asked, what famous books have flashbacks? And I was, I don't have copies of them. I can't get through them. I thought, what famous short stories have flashbacks? The, <laughs> the top of the list moves. was Hemingway. <laughs> and that's great because Hemingway writes concisely. This is from The Short Happy Life of Francis Malcomer. And I have not actually read the whole thing because I was just found it today. But the setup is you have a couple, an American couple, that is in Africa on a safari hunting big game. And it starts with the celebration after the husband has shot his lion. But very soon as it goes along, you realize that, in fact, he didn't shoot the lion. There was something else that happened. He was a coward. Everybody is pretending. So you come to this point knowing lots of dropped hints that they're all lying to, to support that this guy actually shot the lion. And there's a conversation with um, Hunter that he hires to help him out. He says, I'm awfully sorry about that lion business. It doesn't have to go any further, does it? I mean, no one will hear about it, will they? And then the uh, hunter says, no, I'm a professional hunter. We never talk about our clients. You can be quite easy on that. It's supposed to be bad form to ask us not to talk, though. Anyway, so this guy... We see from several angles, people interacting with him, how little they think about him because he did not kill his own lion. But I did mark where the transition is. So we had a scene where we had a conversation again between Marcomo and uh, Wilson. I think this might have actually been an extension of the one where where Marcomo is asking him not to tell. And he's saying, you know, it's bad for him to to do that. And it goes back and forth. And Marcomo says, I like to clear away that lion business. It's not very pleasant to have your wife see you do something like that. I would think it would be even more unpleasant to do it, Wilson thought, wife or no wife, or to talk about having done it. But he said, I wouldn't think about that anymore. Anyone would be upset by his first lion. That is all over. One thing about the story is that it's written in third person omniscient, so it jumps around. And at one point, it even jumps into the lion's head. So it doesn't follow the biggest idea of a single point of view. But then we go to a sequel with Francis Macomber, this guy that didn't shoot the lion, back in his bed and thinking. And then, then it goes to, it had started the night before when he had wakened and heard the lion roaring somewhere off the river. So we're jumping into flashback. And there's also a summary. And then the main part of the story is all the flashback. So it goes from page 11 here to page 21, where it jumps back into the aftermath with the line of, no one had said anything more until they were back in camp. That was the story of the lion, back to the main period. So it jumps around a lot. It does. 
He structures the short story so that you have the setup of the characters in the aftermath and exactly how they're behaving to each other. And then he jumps to what this event is in flashback, which you know something has happened, but you don't know the various details. And then he jumps to the rest of the story, which is just kind of playing itself out, I think. So, right. So what we've gotten here is we've gone over these two techniques. And there are other techniques there that could be applied, but they're much more subtle and so I was thinking for an exercise that we could each write one of these. So one of us would write a flashback within a sequel, and one of us would write a scene interrupting another scene. Now who's going to do what? I don't know. Draw straws, flip a coin. I ideally would like to do this as something from my book so I could get double, double writing duty out of it. And I think I was we'll... going to do a scene within a scene. Okay. And the scene within a sequel works really well with memoir because I'm always looking back. So we're both doing things that we have done in the past, so it's not a brand new thing, but maybe we can take the Bickham approach with a much more strict scene and sequel rules to our sections. Yeah, I think I am planning on writing up the note cards for the scene. Okay. And then doing the variation. Okay, so we're going to totally go Bickham on a way of writing our own variations in scene and structure. Right, down to the outlining process. There we go. And so we're going to cut our episode and come back after we've worked hard on this and, and report on it. And we'll report on one of ours, but the other one we're saving for our Patreon account. Renee, tell them about what they get on a Patreon. So on Patreon, you get bonus episodes. We will workshop what we've written for this exercise, one of us. But then, you know, the other person is in an extended episode that we offer on Patreon. Uh, we also have chapter notes. We call them snark notes because they are rather snarky. But there's lots and lots of examples, which you don't always get in this book. So if you want to really get the most out of what Bickham has to offer, you come to Patreon and you'll get our snark notes. And I put a lot of work into them, just so you know. And there are there are eight other bullet points of variations you can do that he talks about. Renee will cover all of them. Right. And not in programming a VCR speak. It'll actually be really good for you to have to look for examples of this stuff. It helps me, you know, figure out like, I don't quite understand what he's trying to say. But if I break it down and I interpret it, it helps me too. It will help you as well. We also have a community of writers. Uh, so you, if you do our highest tier, the Azuki tier, uh, you can do the activities and submit them and you will get feedback from us. Oh, and one last thing. We have another talk coming up. If you are interested in using podcasting to promote yourself as a writer, we are doing a podcasting for writers for the National Women's Book Association on November 11th. Now, do they need to be members to do that? You do need to be a member, but man, they have a lot of stuff. There's workshops on there. There's talks all the time. So I believe this is like a lunch meet and greet that we're doing the presentation for. So if you would like to know more about how to podcast your way into the writing world, uh, this is the talk for you. And it is on November 11th. And we'll have information about that on our show notes. Yes. Okay. Let's get to writing. To writing. And we're back with Renee's exercise. So Renee is doing a sequel with a flashback embedded, which is very common in memoir, correct? Yes. And also like, you know, literary books, like protagonists will be thinking and then they'll think back. Something will trigger a flashback. Do you usually write your flashbacks in a kind of a sequel era of your book or do you ever write them in the middle of the scene itself? You know, I, I didn't know about the sequels before we started reading the book. So I don't know if I could say that. I think maybe I did, but I didn't have structure before I would just write and it just felt right. Like I wrote in response to what I read. So I don't know, <laughs> <laughs> but I did pick a scene that I turned into a flashback because I had a hard time figuring out how to write a sequel to it. Like, how do I react to the situation and how do I relay it to the reader? So I used Bickham's method to do that. I don't know if it's any good, but it was something I've been struggling with. So maybe this one works. So you took a scene you had and you stuck it into a sequel. So you didn't have to worry about putting a sequel after the scene. Right. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> well, there's still a sequel after the flashback scene. Okay. So I don't think I need to do much of a setup. I'll just start reading and it'll be good. All right. 
My husband and I are at the bike shop. We talk with the guy with the spotty gray beard behind the counter, and Max tells one of his speeches about wanting to stop an unsuspecting bicyclist in the middle of the street to tell him their tire is too low. Apparently, a low tire makes it so much harder to ride. The man laughs with him, a faint laugh mixing with the din of hissing and sawing metal filling up what can only be described as a warehouse of windows full of bikes strung up on the ceiling like animals on hooks. A bicycle shop is not unlike a car shop, I realize. All the while Max tells his story, the man's hands are busy, deftly lining tape over a piece of metal. The distance between each line is perfect. The hissing sound starts and stops. A drill takes turns whirring with the pump that's hissing. The man raises his eyebrows at me. I don't ride much, I admit. This is Max's hobby. I share a story about the time Max had to reteach me how to ride a bike in my 30s. I practically lived on a bike as a kid, just like every other kid in the 80s, but I hadn't ridden in over a decade. And it's not true what they say. You really can forget how to ride a bike, or at least decades old banana bike scales don't carry over well to gear shifts and inch wide wheels. The man's shoulders shake a little when we laugh and Max joins in. I can't help but feel I was just embraced into the kid's table at a stranger's Thanksgiving. Pop, a deafening noise, like a car backfiring inches from my ear, splits reality and silences the shop. I am not here. I am falling through time. A shrill scream flies through my lungs and exits my throat. My hand flies to my mouth. I'm six years old again, and it's phase one of dad's court appointed every other weekends. Danny and I strap in. Dad starts up his VW van, and we rumble through downtown Sacramento and stop at an AMPM for gas. Go get your candy bar, dad says. We leap out of the van and run to the monolith and candy inside while dad pays 20 for a fill up. I'm standing below that tall mountain of glorious candy and debate the facts. Should I get a big candy bar or the smaller tasty one? Chocolate, hard candy, or sour powder? Reese's Pieces or whatchamacallit? Fun dips or big league bubble gum? Do I want to inhale a Hershey in a couple of minutes then afterwards enviously watch Danny take his time eating a Charleston chew or make Danny salivate for my cherry Jolly Rancher while it tears up the roof of my mouth? The debate was a spell pulling me into some portal, a mistake of time and space where minutes stretched like bubble gum and sound was sealed in an airtight wrapper. Danny picks up a Snickers then puts it back. I slip my fingers over the slick plastic of the fun dip in my palm and reach to trade sour for chocolate. The movement temporarily breaks the spell and the world of chinging registers and idling cars shimmers. The coffee machine sputters and the register bell rings. Danny and I know what will happen if we hadn't picked our candy by the time dad got back but we're floating again, and I pick up Reese's and hold it, then trade it for the sugary fun dip, imagining Danny stuffing those limp pink threads of bubble gum from the big league pack. The door swishes open and the bell chimes. Danny bends over for a Jolly Rancher. We don't hear dad approach from behind. We never do. Just feel the deafening roar of his voice, an air raid towering behind and above. Are you still picking a fucking candy bar? I told you to hurry up. Why does it take so long to pick a fucking candy bar? Now, now, now. Dad's voice is always as big as his stomach. Deep percussion like a bass drum and as sudden as a pair of crashing cymbals. Devastating as a bomb blast and as quick as a burst of semi-automatic rounds. A drill sergeant. An exploding building. Amateur bottle rockets at midnight on New Year's. A drive-by on a muggy evening. A cosmic shattering of chemicals governing space and time. Rupturing at the, at the rate a balloon pops. His mouth is a firearm. Our names are a spray of bullets. You think my body would move, run at least, or hide. But I stand rigid every time Dad does this, which is every time we stand in front of the candy. We know Dad never reacts halfway. He's a spray of napalm when we don't move fast enough, forget a jacket at the restaurant, or tie our shoes. What's strange is how I continually forget my jackets on diner seats and strangers' car seats. How Danny won't turn off the TV the first time he's told. My body is frozen, yet jittering inside a shimmying in place, the body a beaker full of baking soda, the world of backfiring cars and fireworks a shot of vinegar. I wonder what's going on in Danny's body. Are we feeling the same thing? Is panic universal? I do not know how our bodies unstick themselves, but they do. All the while dad tells us to move it, move it, move it, while we deposit the candy on the counter, hop back into dad's VW van with the clunking gear shifts and smelly exhaust. Phase one is over. 
Dad lights up his 25th cigarette, and we were off to phase two of Dad's weekend, the video store. Someone, whoever overfilled the tire, chuckles somewhere in the back of the bike shop. I notice Max staring at me. I feel embarrassed in the way a child, too old for such things, wakes up to discover they've wet the bed. Doors slamming, cars backfiring, off-season fireworks echoing down our suburban street always makes me scream. My body just reacts, a kind of chemical reaction to sudden loud noises. I have neither survived a war nor a firefight. The worst part is the regret, the embarrassment, a swelling stone in my stomach. I lose control of my body. I cannot control myself. You can never take back the choices you never make. It's quiet now in the shop, an absence of noise. No one feels like speaking. The man looks down and I turn red. He punches keys on the register. Max gives him money and we leave. We are all embarrassed for me. I'm convinced I'm the only one who can't figure out why. That is a wonderful piece of writing. I oh, just, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> oh, I've been trying to write that piece for a long time. Maybe this is the one that's good. I don't know. I love the details. You know, you do suck the cherry Jolly Ranchers on the top of your mouth and have them rip off. You capture all that 80s candy so perfectly. <laughs> All the people of our generation are having flashbacks. Yes, yes, absolutely. <laughs> like this bit about your father, was dad's voice is always as big as his stomach. Deep percussion like a bass drum and as sudden as a pair of crashing cymbals, devastating as a bomb blast and as quick as a burst of semi-automatic rounds. A drill sergeant, an exploding building, amateur bottle rockets at midnight and New Year's. A drive-by on a mucky evening, a cosmic shattering of chemicals governing space and time, rupturing at the rate a balloon pops. His mouth is a firearm, our names a spray of bullets. That's Poet Renee kicking in. That is Poet Renee, definitely. <laughs> Only I could add structure. <laughs> then I would be set. That's what Bickham's here for. Okay, so let's talk about structure for this piece. It's not exactly a sequel that you've embedded it to. It's kind of a sequel, but you're actually in a scene at the beginning here, right? Yeah, but then I go into sequel. So the point we go into sequel is... Right after the pop. My hand flies to my mouth, and then I, I, have, a, I have a flashback. Oh, shit. Does this count as thinking? I guess I'm supposed to have emotion. Isn't this the same as emotion? You have a bit of emotion, yeah. You got the... Um... My hand flies to my mouth. I'm like, <gasps> yeah, yeah. You definitely have the emotion. And then, and then you say, um, I'm six years old again. And it's phase one of dad's court appointment every other weekends. So then we've got the moving into the flashback. Right. Which is to me, I think a form of thinking maybe. It is, but it's very reactive. I mean, this is a, this is different than that kind of calm. Like you're jumping right to us. So yeah. When we had the, Bickham scene that he gave us. That one started on a sequel where the guy was on the run. So obviously there was some disaster where he was on the run. And now he was sitting and looking and feeling the emotion for being on the run and then looking and slowly going back into a bit of a summary of his life and then jumping to an actual scene. There's actually a few lines in here. He says, this is from uh, Appendix 5. Whatever I do, he thought, there will be suffering. He was sick of it, sick of suffering, of dilemmas, of uncertainty and loss, sick of himself. He remembered his childhood in Sirkin. Right. So in that case, there's the emotion of him being sick of everything and all that, and then going back to his childhood and then starting the thought. Mm. And then that's the thought. And this has a lot more energy because the scene ends with the pop and then Renee jumps into flashback. Do you think I need to think first? Just a quick reminder from our sequel episode, all of the pieces uh, of a sequel are reaction, thought, planning, and then action. Basically, yeah, there's an emotional response. There's a mental response where you can put all your thinking stuff into it. There's a decision, decision, and then an action. And then that bumps you into the next scene. When I was listening to you read it, I was almost wondering if you didn't want to have a setup where instead of it being a noise, it was like some kids coming in with their father and that triggering mm. the difference in what they were doing with what your father had done to you. But I can see why you did this because you're actually talking about how you can't hold yourself back from reacting this way when you're with Max and it kind of messes stuff up. Or just in general, like, you know, like it is a thing and it, it sucks. It's like a reaction and it's very embarrassing. 
this loud noise happens and it's like, I cannot stop myself from like giving a little scream, which is funny sometimes. But in this instance, it was actually really embarrassing because the guy got really quiet. Everyone got quiet. And I'm like, stop looking at me. <laughs> it's a high energy flashback. Mm -hmm. And we get it because you exit the flashback and we totally understand why you're emotionally so rung up and why everything else afterwards is so rough as well. Because it's not merely the fact that you screamed, but the fact that all this memory is flashed into your head afterwards. So there's something missing then, right? I'm, I'm just trying to figure out like, is there something missing or something wrong? It's, it's much tighter than what Bickham was talking about. Would it help if I added like a little bit more setup for the flashback? Because all I have is I'm six years old again. That's it. <laughs> One thing I didn't quite get was how the sound triggered the memory of your father yelling at you. And then you jump directly into your dad telling you, go get a candy bar. It's obvious that, you know, that these weekend appointed visits are not great, but we don't actually see what's linking that. I almost wonder if you didn't want to have a bit about why you react to sound this way mm. at the beginning, because that would give you a thinking. That's true. And then you could go back to this one moment that you remember. Right. Actually, that was original. That would came first. And I think I'm going to move it. There's a spot at the end that says, someone who ever overfilled the tire chuckles somewhere in the back of the bike shop. I notice Max staring. I feel embarrassed. Door slamming. And then I think door slamming, cars backfiring, always make me scream. My body just reacts. And all that is thinking. I have neither survived a war nor a firefight. And the worst part is the regret. Um, I'll move that up. That carries the thought. And then the natural flow is why is Renee like this or what particular thing triggers it? Especially with the comment about the car and such that moves it to the memory of getting in the car with your father and having him say, you guys get candy bars. Yeah. And then at the end though, it goes straight from the scene slash sequel where I'm, I'm having a sequel at the end of this flashback. Um, I do not have bodies and stick themselves, but they do. Do you have a Bickham decision and action at the end? No, I do not. I have <laughs> missed the decision and the action. Well, what happens after this? I mean, we're going to leave. What happens in your memoir after this? What comes after this bit? Um, this is just an isolated, yeah, that's the thing is it's not, my, my memoir doesn't necessarily act linearly into a cause and effect relationship. So this is an event that happened in my life, but it's not attached to anything, which is a big problem in my book because I write in these like vignettes. It's hard for me to connect them all. You need to know what comes next after this. Mm -hmm. Are you then going to take some action to get yourself in a better place or is this set up for like more stuff that your dad's doing that's coming on, on top of you? Or like, what do you think comes next in the book after this? So here's the thing. I used the event at the bike shop as a framing device for this story. Okay. In the book, actually, I do know what happens next. I'm talking about dad's every other weekends. And he had these phases that he would go through. Like the first phase one is you stop off at AMPM and get candy and he yells at you. Then we go get killer clowns from outer space at the video store. Then we come home and have what they call a party dinner, which like he would get like cans of olives and easy cheese, the, the kind in a can, and he would get the um, Ritz crackers, or he would make pepperoni tacos. He would fry pepperoni. It, it's pretty disgusting. And I actually put the recipe in the book. But see, as a thing is I have this description, but besides it happening to me and it being a memoir about my life as a kid, how this ties into anything, I'm not sure. So this is part of my issue while writing this book. And I'm sure other memoirists are having issues. That same issue, like how do you make it matter or give it a point? Or if even that's even the problem. If this is meant to be a framing device, it should have a transition to why you start remembering your past. It's tricky, isn't it? Because part of memoir is you're writing it from a point where you're safe and not as much stuff is happening and you're going to your flashbacks which is actually where the stuff is happening right i mean in the original there was no like framing device i didn't write about the bike I, I was just writing about me as a kid and this was one part of it but i realized for this activity i could use this scene as a flashback to practice flashbacks so i don't know if i will keep the bike scene mm -hmm. i don't know do you think i should keep the bike scene do you like the framing device that's part of the whole book itself how well it fits? Mm, I see.
I think you captured so many aspects of a bike store and that easy interaction you have with the guy that's working. I love the fact that you mentioned that his hands are doing stuff at the same time and just the comfortable acceptance you have there versus once you scream and the uncomfortable after bit, it's powerful. You don't want to have someone ever lose a scene that's really powerful or a sequel here that's really powerful. But the question is, how do you get it to work with everything else? Exactly. So in Bickham's thing, let's see how he did it. So line 251 is back to the present. So that now all he could do was keep hiding, see if the CIA's promises were fulfilled. If they were, there was hope. If the CIA failed him, he was doomed, like his family. A truck horn sounded on the highway beyond the motel entrance. The sound jarred Partek out of his reverie, reminding him of the danger and the need to move. He closed his motel unit door, tossed the cigarette into a puddle on the pavement, and climbed into his truck. He had to keep moving, do the unexpected. It was the only thing he was sure about right now. Wow, he really does have decision and action in here. Like, it's in there. <laughs> so what he does, the decision he makes is what he was already going to do. I don't know if there was a point earlier that made it sound like he was going to turn himself in. And in this case, you are being, Rene, keep doing what you're doing because there's no other choice. You need to live with the fact that you don't really fit into this world that Max has, even though you want to. Maybe the decision actually is to examine those trips with dad. Mm, yeah, it could be like me trying to investigate why I do this or the effects that my childhood is having on my present. Yeah, or like the damage is done where we're, we walk out of the store um, embarrassed. I go to my room and I sit and think about those days with dad. Yeah. So a decision to actually go over those experiences could be your decision and action of the sequel. That's true. I just realized there's like a, I just had a flashback right now <laughs> of workshops <laughs> in poetry. Huh? Sometimes somebody would find one line in the poem and they go, this line right here is your thesis. They'd be like, this is the heart of your poem, this one line. And I think there might be a line in here, maybe, the theme could be, I lose control of my body. I cannot control myself. You can never take back the choices you never make. I wonder if that might be the key here. I'm going to say that the, one of the cool things about working on Bickham is I have yet to hear him say theme at all in his work. <laughs> he does not have any. Yeah, you're right. No, no, we don't worry about themes. That is a higher processing of your memoir that you need to do but for right now the only thing you need to do with this piece is you need to make sure that it goes back to sequel and it has renee make a decision that is to examine all the shitty stuff her dad did so we can get into the heart of this chapter about your father just based on workshops i've taken and in other things i've learned dear memoir writer theme is very important bickham does not talk much about that in his book what do you think? Do you think in terms of theme, Kim, when you're writing your chapters? Right. Um, my two characters have an overall goal. Like my character of Sufi, who I've talked about, has this goal to get out of this in-between space she is because she couldn't pass her wizarding exams and actually go on and live the life she wants to live. And that is driving all the aspects of the scenes where she's in. I'm not sure if that's actually a theme. Hmm. Back to Bickham. You can have a lot more cause and effect in a novel. And I am very much building up what's the cause, what's the effect, what does that affect, what does that affect. Right. Well, this was illuminating. Writing this, I felt like I had more control over what was happening. More than I have in the past. I think it's part of the podcast. When I was writing this, I wasn't being overly like, prescriptive you know I wasn't like make sure I have this this and this obviously I missed the last two details of the sequel does it read more organized and clear than my other work in the past I think it is much more organized your time with Max in the bike shop is a very normal scene it's a very healthy this is the way a lot of people live their lives scene so there's nothing that needs to be explained of why the situation here is fucked up Okay, mm -hmm. which some of the other stuff with the funerals and stuff like that, you can see this is really a bad situation for a lot of reasons. 
And then the scene with you and your brother, the decision to choose the candy to make sure that you have the best candy choice, that is a very natural kid perspective. What I think really reads well with this is you don't have to explain any of these things. You just show them and we know how they work. And then the point where your father comes in and his outbursts and that part that is not healthy and is not good, because that's the one thing that's out of place, it's much easier to pay attention to that. It's not overflowing. There's like a very particular thing that your father's doing that is unhealthy and, and not good, and we can see it right there. Well, so that's the show don't tell. <laughs> um, looking for something to revise and put in this activity made me go back and look at some of my old chapters, which I felt I'm pretty solid in and it's okay. And I'm reading them going, oh my God, time has passed. We've read like three books now. And I'm seeing a lot and I'm like, I'm getting it ready for this retreat before the retreat, going through them and redoing some stuff before, because I don't want to work on old stuff at the retreat, but all of this stuff is really working in my favor. Yeah. Even if it's not necessarily lying because it's a memoir, it is. And I'm starting to really see that difference. I tend to default to summary. It's well-written summary. It's fun summary, but it's too much summary. And I realized that looking through, trying to find a scene for this. And I do think you could probably go through and cut a little bit here and there. Like there's a lot of candy choices there. You could probably get the same effect with a little less the fun dips or the big league. Darlings, yeah. Yeah, you could, you could tighten this up. Oh, and the metaphors. I have way too many. I got to cut that down. Less is more. <laughs> but I guess I went wild, you know, and I just let it all out. I think it's great to let it all out because then you pick the stuff that really is the best candy metaphors. Yeah. Yeah. Because candy's awesome. <laughs> I love candy. Okay. <laughs> all right. Well, thank you so much, Kim. I feel like I learned a lot today. And I feel like I'm going to learn a lot too when we go over my scene within a scene piece, which I haven't quite started yet, but I'm going to learn a lot from it. And we're going to discuss that in our Patreon episode. Yes. Bonus Patreon episode. And we would love to have more members on Patreon. It is it is how we make money off of this podcast. And we've, we've been looking at our numbers. Our numbers have been going up. There's more people that are tuning in uh, every two weeks when we release an episode. And we've, that's awesome. And we would love your help in getting our podcast out to more people. So that means uh, liking us or uh, leaving a review on Apple or leaving a review on Apple, or if you know a friend who's a writer, then mentioning our podcast. And yeah, thank you guys all for listening, and we'll see you in two weeks. See you in two weeks. Bye. Bye. Words to Write By is produced by Renee Nelson and Kim smith Adam. Our theme music is Roll Back the Carpet by Cool Cat Music. Have a great day. Okay. <laughs> Strike that from the record.